All right, so this episode opens up with a monkey letting us know that we ain't in King's Landing. Um, and we also see Tywin Lannister trying his best to bargain with the leaders of Essos. Uh, and it's also the leaders of the Three Daughters, aka the Free Cities, to and he's trying to bargain with them to help him with the blockades that are being held in place by Lord Corlys's ships. Um. And this is a really interesting way to open the episode because it expands the world of Game of Thrones again. Like, we knew about these three free cities. We don't visit them often enough. And it's so refreshing to not only visit them, but just really see a world that isn't under the rule of the Iron Throne. Because they don't really, they don't really mess with the Lannisters all like that. And they don't really care much for the Iron Throne and the people sitting on it. So it's really interesting and refreshing for Game of Thrones to open up with this. It's almost like a little bit of a shock. Uh, but hey, this, this is what we're doing. Um, but anyway, he's meeting with these leaders of the Free Cities and to help them try to overcome Lord Corliss with the blockades that are blocking goods from coming into King's Landing. And they let him know that they'll help if the king agrees to give them the stepstones and allows them to tax any of the ships that travel through. Now, this just will just essentially undo everything that Lord Corliss and Damon fought for back in season one. And this would actually hand the land over back to the very people that they were fighting against um thailand agrees but he doesn't do so without a lot of hesitation or resistance right he knows that aemon uh is not going to be happy with essos taxing the goods that came into king's landing they also require that thailand gets the agreement of the commander of the ships of admiral Lohar. And basically, if they don't get this admiral's blessings, then soldiers just ain't gonna fight. And we we see this admiral, uh, Sharako Lohar, and this is a little bit of a shock to some folks because I think in the books Sharako Lohar was originally male, and the show just kind of surprised everyone that decided to do a woman to play the character. And I think it's kind of cool uh, with Abigail Thorne's portrayal of the character. My understanding is that she's a YouTuber. I'm, I'm going to look her up, see if I uh, to give her a follow and all that good stuff. But she's a YouTuber who was given a role in House of the Dragon. I can't help but get some slight Jack Sparrow vibes. Uh, but she also kind of looked like Alloy from Horizon Zero Dawn. Um, and then they just set up Thailand to go on a side quest to introduce us to someone who's going to be uh, more so important in season three than in this season. And yeah, I, I think that's the common feeling from a lot of folks in that this episode just has a lot of moments that feel like they're more so set up for the next season than really try to button things up for this season. Uh, we didn't see Vagar. And we see this Vagar finally get gully. Uh, the problem is, is that Vagar uh, isn't caught up in a dance of dragons. And instead, uh, we see Vagar was sent to task to burning some helpless villagers in a place called Sharp Point. Now, Sharp Point belongs to House Lord of House Bar Emin of Lord Bar Emin. And Bar Emin is a character who is sworn to Rhaenyra. Um, and this is more so just, I don't know, this is Aemon's lame response to being scared away by Rhaenyra at the end of last episode. And it's kind of, it's kind of lame, right? It's kind of lame that Aemon was so hurt or bothered by being sent running from Rhaenyra and her dragons that he just decided to pick a fight with a helpless village. But I ain't gonna lie, Rhaenyra was about to jump his ass, right? Cyrax, Vermithor, and Silverwing, they was they was they was ready. They was ready. Uh, but yeah, Aemon is kind of the lame duck in this episode in that he's he's just uh, he's just going through all of his emotions after being proven that he's not as unstoppable as he thought he was. 
Uh, we then seen King Aegon and Master Orwell having a chat. And I got to admit that Aegon almost looks re recognizable now. Like, I'm not going to lie. He, he does look like the Chicken McNugget formerly known as Aegon. And half his face is still kind of effed up. But I can kind of see his features now. Uh, Sir Laris shows up and tells Aegon that, yo, it's, it's time to go. It's time to go. Not now, but like right now. Because word is getting around that Rhaenyra's got them dragging, right? And they had Aemon running like a mitch and everybody heard about it. They all out here saying in these streets that Aemon's a stupid mitch. He's just a punk bitch. He's just a scary punk mitch who got punked by his half-sister. The one true queen and protector of the realms. Mitch, you ugly mitch. I'm sorry, yeah. I'm sorry. I got a little carried away. <laughs> Aegon and Lara start talking through all the different ways that Aegon is screwed and starts talking about how they can have a good life in Bravos, at least for a while, right? They, they could go and they could just start over. And um, it's in this moment they talk also about how Aegon's dragon is cooked. And I'm like, what? What? Sunfire didn't make it? Yo, how in the holy goose did that happen? When did that happen? What? Sunfire is done? Like, I'm pretty sure in the books that Sunfire, I, I, don't, I didn't read the books. I, I only know but so much, but I'm pretty sure Sunfire didn't meet his end in the Battle of Rook's Rest in the books. So for them to make this change in the show, that's a pretty significant change. So either the dragon really is done or Aegon just doesn't know. So there's a possibility, but this 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 kind of threw me off. I, I wasn't expecting this. I wasn't expecting them to say that at all, that Sunfire was done. Woo. It's tragic out here in these streets for the Greens. Um, I got you, Ash Ronald. I'm, I'm gonna get back to that. Mm, mm, give me a second. I'm gonna circle back to that. Um, but right now, learning that this dragon is off the board is a major thing. Uh, but man, yeah, <laughs> let's be honest, we down a dragon over here, but and that's not the only lizard we lost, as Aegon tells him. Uh, where am I at? Aegon tells him that look, he also lost his other sea snake, so to speak, and he doesn't even have working plumbing any. Like, this pipe bursts like a sausage on the spit. When he goes to pee, it just pours down his leg. It, dang up, this is sad. This is sad. Nobody feels bad for Aegon. I feel bad, for Aegon. Look. Nobody feel bad. I feel bad for you, bro. I knew you didn't even want to be king. They threw you into this. This is, this is, wow. This, this is a little depressing. I didn't expect this to happen. Um, we then, <laughs> but we then hear Sir Laris bait him. He baits him again. And he calls him all these so-called names to try to be remembered. And you can see in this moment, um, him realizing that he's being played right he's being played by that game that they often play on the leaders of the iron of king's landing whoever sits on the iron throne they play that remembrance game you know and then they start throwing nicknames at you you know you're gonna be the king who the rebuild Aegon the rebuilder and all that and that seems to be a running theme in the stories whether it's game of thrones or house of the dragon you know when when we look in these stories when they read from the history books they're telling the truth the only thing people will know of you is what's in the history books and what other people write of you is what goes in them but if you get to be the narrator of your own story then even the better right Aegon the magnanimous <laughs> um but none of these names really stick with Aegon and he says you know He's Aegon, the realm's delight. And that kind of hurts because he sees it, right? 
he sees it all with how people have just been using him the entire time. And I, I, I do feel ba bad for Aegon a little bit. Like, he didn't want to be king. Yes, he was a terrible king, but it was a, a role that he wanted. He was manipulated by his mom and grandfather to taking this job. And he just wanted to be, you know, a drunkard, you know, going from brothel to brothel. He had, he's a simple man with simple wishes. We then switched to Reyna and she's desperately thirsty, drinking out of whatever stream she found or whatever fire hydrant, I don't know. And it's kind of weird because... You know, Reyna just straight up abandoned her armed escort, as well as those dragon eggs. And she abandoned um, Rhaenyra's other kids to go Pokemon hunting. And I don't know, you gotta go catch them all, but yeah. This, this is supposedly, you know, a big change from the books. And which we know later in the episode, she's gonna meet up with the wild dragon, Sheep Stealer. But I won't go into too much detail as to what is different from the books, as I don't want to spoil something that could still potentially happen. Uh, in a future season or in a future episode, but it certainly feels like Reyna is going to claim the dragon sheep steel. Uh, we then switch to Jace, Ulf, and Hugh, and my gosh, does this scene go foul fast. Ulf has his feet up on the table of the small council. And, and you you can see Hugh was already trying to talk some sense into Ulf before Jace even arrived. But things turn up when Jace arrives and Jace is not happy at all that Ulf has his mother blood pucking feet up on the mother blood pucking tape. And Ulf has no idea who Jace is. And you know what? I can't even really be mad at him for that. Because I mean... There are a lot of Targaryens and Valerians to remember, and they don't have the benefit of this channel to help them keep up with all the players in the game. Um, Ulf has no idea who Jace is, but when Ulf does learn who he is, the first thing he does is tries to hug him, right? Oh, we cousins, you know, how you doing? Come in for a hug, touch his hand, look how big you got. And Ulf is treating him just like he's an extended family. But Jace has no idea what all these things, you know, all this stuff called affection or emotional engagement. He, he don't know what that is. He, he's not familiar with that kind of stuff. Targaryens ain't really like that, right? We don't really see Targaryens hug each other. When they do, they might kiss you. But he's, he's not really used to this and basically tells him that he better shut up and soldier. Shut up. Let Jace assert his dominance, even as the dark-haired prince, and go out there and soldier. Get in line. That's what Jace wants right now. Um, and, and, you know, I feel them because he's still feeling threatened over these new dragon riders who are now in a position of power. You know, I said it in the last live stream, but Jace is thinking after about what comes next. Right? About what happens after Rhaenyra takes the Iron Throne. Rhaenyra ain't thinking that far ahead, but Jace is. Just like he witnessed his own mother and her inheritance to the throne get taken from her. He's worried that, you know, when she does take the throne and she lives her hopefully long life and dies of natural causes, that when she does pass on, that he gets to just, you know, take his inheritance. But He's worried that these new dragon riders, given time, given time to really get acclimated to power and the holding, uh, uh, wielding the power of a dragon. What's to stop one of these little silver haired, uh, lowborn people from saying that they have a better claim to the throne than this dark haired imposter? And Jace has a legitimate reason to feel threatened by Hugh Ulf and these other dragon riders. Because any one of them in his mind has just as much claim, if not more, to the Iron Throne when Rainier is gone. Food for thought, you know, I'm I'm curious if uh Rainier thought this far ahead or if she's starting to think this far ahead. Uh, but I'm really curious what's gonna happen later when let's say the battle is over and they still gotta handle all. Like this 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 dude don't know how to act. What are they gonna do with him? Uh, 
we then we then switch to Rhaenyra getting some advice from her hand Lord Corliss uh, Corliss says now is the time right now's the time get out there and strike now while they have the numbers but doesn't at all mention that you know one of his new one of her new dragon riders just also happens to be his son he, he doesn't bring that up at all but you know that's a little rough like my guy is still ain't claiming him like you still ain't trying to he's a dragon right come on my guy anyway Rhaenyra was still holding out hope that she could you know intimidate the greens to finish this fight without having to finish this fight and I guess this is her being somewhat sincere uh back during last episode when she said as much to the dragon seed she was walking among them and she was like well I hope just you claiming the dragon will be enough we won't actually have to go to war uh but that was all before she let them get cooked by Vermithor um uh, and let's keep it a stack let's let's honestly keep it a stack um what is she thinking what is she thinking? Like, honestly, it's a buffer. Too much has happened. Corliss reminds her of this and also reminds her that the Greens have two more dragons. In addition to Vagar, they still have Greenfire and Tessaria. Corliss also reminds her that Aemon has a temper and he's going to do whatever it takes. Corliss basically tells Rhaenyra right three words of advice to live by. Don't be stupid. Don't be stupid. Hopefully that sinks in. Corliss also tells her that he renames his ship to the Queen Who Never Was, and his ships are ready to strike. She has six dragons, and it's up to her to strike while the Iron Throne is hot, and she needs to do this before too much time passes. Oh, and don't forget about your loose edge. Now, I, I like this scene with Lord Corliss. I like uh, him finally having a moment where he's giving advice to the queen. Like, we don't really see that from him this that much this season. He backs her up, but he didn't really have any moments where he was just giving her his advice. And it's solid advice. It's solid to see this from Lord Corliss. I'm afraid it might be the only time we see him give advice to her, but it was cool to actually see him exercise his right as the head even if just for <laughs> so let me stop right here real quick uh gothic chick i know you i bet you you was team black you've been team black since day one i knew that but appreciate you um off topic did you hear ghost rider nicholas cage was gonna be in deadpool and wolverine i did hear that I hear that the thought came out, but it kind of didn't get to the point as far as like Wesley Snipes' blade did. But I appreciate you sharing that information. Thank you, Ash Ronald. Um, and Miss T, I think Sunfire is done fighting for sure, but done? No. See, I hope not, right? Sunfire, Sunfire was like the most likable dragon on this show. Maybe May least is a strong second. But Sunfire was absolutely the happy puppy of the bunch. So I'm hoping that we see Sunfire come back. Uh, I think in the books, Sunfire didn't meet its end at that point. But clearly the show is doing its own thing as it changes some of the story. And we go into future seasons. But I hope we see more of Sunfire in, uh, in future episodes. I appreciate you. Uh, but where were we? Um, Lord Corliss, he gave his advice. Uh, oh, we then switch to the Damon, who was met by this turncoat, Sir Alfred, right? Sir Alfred Broome was sent here uh, to Harrod Hall by Rhaenyra to try to figure out what it is that Damon's intentions are now that he's raised this army. The problem is that Sir Alfred really has some traitorous intentions, which even the ghost in Harrod Hall is calling him out on. Like, everybody knows. Uh... And he even tells Damon, like straight up, instead of continuing on this path to follow Rhaenyra that she set him out on, he honestly believes in that what the realm needs right now isn't a queen, but rather a king. And, you know, I'm gonna be honest, we, we kind of saw this build up. I'm not 100% surprised that he wanted to be a traitor because we saw this build up throughout the season with Sir Alfred 
giving his advice to Rhaenyra to be more aggressive with her use of her dragons in the war, and Rhaenyra was just honestly being a lot more passive and restrained. She never really wanted to unleash them. She knew what kind of mayhem would happen if she did. She wanted to save as many innocent lives as possible, but it frustrated her small council to no end, to the point where now we see Sir Alfred is ready to switch teams. Um, and again, we watched him build up resentment toward her all season. It, it, I honestly think it was actually a little foolish for, Rhaeny for Rhaenyra to think that Sir Alfred or any of the folks on her council, for that matter, wouldn't have dissenting thoughts over time. Um, it was a little immature of her, but it's also just her inexperience. The whole thing was witnessed by Sir Simon, who put on his snitching hat immediately. Like, he couldn't wait to go snitch. Like, send the raven. Oh my goodness. Um, we then switched to Aemon. Not really given about the people of King's Landing. Again. Like, again, my guy just really does not care about how his war is making things hard on the civilians of the kingdom. This time, he doesn't care about how the crown increasing the time and possible cost of goods is a bad thing on the citizens of King's Landing. And it's starting to look like this guy right here is starting to get fed up. I don't know how this is going to play out, but we constantly see this dude, uh, whether he's speaking to Sir Laris or even talking to Eamon directly, just seemingly getting frustrated. So I'm curious to see what happens with him uh, in future seasons and episodes as well. We did switch to Helena and Allison trying to understand why everyone hates them and why they were attacked out in these streets. Allison says the same thing that Sir Laris told Eamon when she says that even though they aren't the ones that caused the hardship, the people look to them to fix things and resolve these issues because they're the leaders. She then asks Helena what she thinks about the idea of just leaving King's Landing altogether. Helena asks her, like, where would, where would they go? Now, this is interesting, especially since we know that later in the episode that Helena doesn't leave the castle with Allison. Allison goes all the way to Dragonstone later in the episode, but Helena stays behind and she has that second conversation later with Amy. Anyway, I just thought that was interesting because it felt intentional that she wanted to stay behind. So let's 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 hold that thought for now. We're going to circle back to this. Eamon barges in and wants to recruit Helena in his war against the Blacks. And Helena tells him that she won't burn anyone. Eamon ain't really trying to take no for an answer. But Allison gets in his face and makes him back down. Now, it's good to see that Allison finally shows some courage and strength to repel back Eamon. Even if it's just this one time, because it came at a crucial time. And she did it. She did it. She went outside. She felt what it was like to be homeless for a while, swam in the lake, and came back with some courage. Go ahead, Allison. I'm proud of you, girl. That's character growth, y'all. That right there, that is character growth. But uh, also, show Eamon also shows some change in his character at this point, because... Up to this point, Eamon has been conducting himself as if he was somewhat unstoppable. His grandfather Otto even confirmed it early in the season when he told Eamon that he and Vagar became the world's greatest superpower. Now, Eamon is acting almost erratic with his actions in burning a helpless village out of spite and now accosting his meek sister Helena to take up arms in this war. And don't get me wrong. Dreamfire ain't no joke because in the grand hierarchy of things, Dreamfire still is a pretty large dragon and it's probably on par with like sea smoke when it comes to size or maybe Caraxes. The whole action of Rhaenyra recruiting the new dragon riders has shifted the hierarchy of power and everyone knows it. The people in King's Landing are spreading rumors about the event of Aemon turning around from Rhaenyra when Silverwing flew over King's Landing. And it also is not lost on Rhaenyra, who was a little bit more confident in her step ever since the new dragon riders claimed their dragons, right? 
now that she's got her army, she's she's a little she's a little at ease. She's not as things don't seem as dire for her any. Um, we didn't switch to see Allison asking the Grand Maester or Wild for passage out of the town, and also asking his discretion. And this is where Allison messes up because. We know that Grand Maester Orwell has been working with Sir Laris and telling her whatever secrets Alicent has. And he's also working on smuggling out the king with Sir Laris. But Alicent doesn't know that. We know that, but Alicent doesn't know that. And this feels like more setup for season three now that he has this additional information. Um... We then switch to Sir Crispy. Sir Crispy! I can't see Sir Crispy in a while. Looking crisp as ever. Over here sniffing up on Allison's napkins. Just sniffing up on that napkin in the middle of a forest. And Sir Gwaine, yo, Sir Gwaine has had enough of this when my guy is over here sniffing up on his sister's napkin like it ain't his sister. And he puts a sword to his neck. And Sir Kristen is just like, I'm ready. Whatever. Look, I'm sorry. Look, my desire for women is my downfall. And it's true. It's true. I, I, it is true. Every person Kristen has gotten together with, it's just been kind of messy. And I might feel bad for him. And Gwen kind of feels bad for him. Especially when Sir Crispy starts talking about his PTSD after watching the war with the dragons in it. He knows that they're headed to go fight Damon and they don't have the numbers. But he's kind of okay with it. And he's making peace with his fate. And Gwen just turns around and sits down. Is this just like, what do we do here? Like, do I this? And I, I, I this this was a really interesting arc for Kristen throughout this season, right? He became the hand. He was super confident. Went into the battle of Rook's Rest. Was planning on having Aemon and Vagar take out whatever poor hapless dragon came to attack, but things went downhill fast when Aegon showed up with Sunfire. Sunfire went down, Aegon went down, but more importantly, Kristen had to watch all of those men burn. And to him, that's like, you know, that's that's like any soldier on a war, whether it's like the Battle of Normandy or whatever, just walking into their demise as dragons rain fire from the sky. And they're absolutely helpless. Them little swords ain't gonna do nothing. Ain't no throwing out. They's, they are helpless. So, the PTSD is real. And he has survivor's remorse. And I, I, I almost feel sorry for him. I, I don't like him, so I can't. But I almost do. Uh, we then switch to see Tylen Lannister in a mud fight with Admiral Sharako and surprising all of us, all of us, when he gets in a good hit or They talk for a little bit more about agreeing to hash out the rest of their deal over debt. And that's going to be an interesting thing. Uh, <laughs> We then switch to Jace and Bela talking about the new dragon riders. And I like this scene right here. I like this scene right here because Jace has had a stick up his butt ever since his mom let it be known that she was going to seek out new dragon riders. Jace has that legitimate concern that, you know, one of the dragon riders could theoretically at some point challenge his, in his inheritance of the Iron Throne since it's an open secret that he's actually an illegitimate child. And it's a legit concern, right? We've seen throughout the show how allegiances can shift, especially with the lords of the different houses, depending on who they believe to be the rightful person to rule. We even get a little bit of that later in the episode with Sir Alfred, so Jace isn't just making a big deal over nothing. 
Bela drops knowledge on him and asks him straight up, do you honestly think you were the first noble heir not sired by his noble birthright? And Jake shuts all the way up. And when you think about it, this feels like a little bit of foreshadowing to King Joffrey, doesn't it? But at least Joffrey was another example and it legit makes you wonder of how many times this has happened. Joffrey was Joffrey Baratheon, thought to be the son of Robert Baratheon and Cersei Lannister. But we all know that he was actually the son of Cersei and uh, his uncle dad. So how many times has this happened in Westeros? This is another one of those examples where it's up to whatever's written in history. But I think ba uh, Bela gives him some solid advice. And I love how personable she's grown towards Jace. Even though they don't have a whole lot of screen time together, it feels like that we're seeing the work being put into what will be the foundation of their marriage someday. someday. So uh, I like that interaction. Uh, we then switch to see Raina sleeping outside and looking real cold. And her her story is just moving slow. But yeah, she cold, y'all. She cold. We then switch to Tywin back with Admiral Sharako. And he's singing some old piratey song for the crowd. And they love it. They are eating it all up. Like, my guy's not even trying. But not only are they hyped, they're appreciative. Look, they all are gathered around. Sharako tells him, like, look. She's down to sail with Tyler to go break up that blockade now. And then we get reminded that... Oh, snap. Yo, she's the op. She is the ops. I forgot she is the ops of the blacks when she starts talking smack about how she's ready to go for the sea smoke or the sea snake. She's ready for all the smoke with the sea snake. And dang it. I was just starting to like her. I wasn't even thinking about that. I wasn't even thinking about that. She is the ops of Lord Corliss. And I'm conflicted. I'm clearly on Lord Corliss' side, but I'm going to miss her. Uh, she also tells Tylen that she wants him to father children with her wives. And Tylen is all like, how many wives? Um, we did switch to see Ult's drunk ass getting on Rhaenyra's last nerve while going in on the food and showing no home training of men. Rhaenyra is trying to be nice to them and offers to make them nice if they act right. And Ulf, Hugh and Adam, they do have matters, right? They do. And Rhaenyra gets a little bit reassured when they show that. And she also lets them know that they're going to fly out in two days to take out some strategic cities. Now, the Dragon Riders aren't totally sold on the idea that they would be flying out to take out innocent bystanders. And I'm kind of with the Dragon Riders on this one, right? We just saw this happen with Aemon at the beginning of the episode. But they're willing to fall in line and do what is asked of them. Jace backs up his mother, even if just to do it. Even if he's just doing it because it enables him to spaz on these dudes. Because why not? But he backs his mother. Ulf's drunk ass keeps talking smack and getting on everybody's nerves. Like... My ears were ringing every friggin' time he yelled, I'll take more of those little birds. And Rhaenyra tells him to F around and find out. And Oak basically is like, I'm ready to find out. I'm ready to find out. Ooh, what happened here? And this whole thing right here had me, had me and Hugh cringing. Every time Ulf smoke spoke. Not only is he drunk off wine, but my guy Ulf is drunk off power. And it feels like now that he's claimed the dragon, he knows that they need him. And he just feels unable to do and say whatever he wants to, whoever he wants. Um, and not only does he not have any manners, he's an opportunist too. Let me see what's going on real. 
right quick real uh real quick right here guys let me uh my screenshot seemed to be a little bit out of order see that's so weird they just loaded now <laughs> Bale is ready to pop. I love that Bale is ready to pop off on these dudes. And Jace basically lets everyone know in right here, right now, I'm 100% okay with being down with one Dragon Rider. It's fine. It's fine. Listen, we can hold tryouts again. It's fine. We still have the numbers. We can take one for the team. Oaf lets them all know that he was just playing. I was I, he was just playing, y'all. He was just playing. Yeah, I, I need to have a sense of humor. But we all know that they don't play like that. Ooh. Hey. Yeah, I'm if I take off my hat. I'm, I always wear my hat. I'm going to take my hat off right now. It's a little warm. The maester then comes in and tells uh, Rhaenyra that a message has come from Harrenhal. Uh, and it's come from Sir Simon. And uh, he's snitching. He's snitching on how Damon and Sir Alfred are plotting betrayal. <laughs> yo, yo, word spreads so fast. It spreads so fast throughout the realms. I'm just so shocked at how quickly this reached all the way to Dragonstone. But Rhaenyra is sick of this ish, and she calls Adam to ride out with her to Harrenhal. Now, we see in this moment that Jace doesn't really like this, and he gives a look, right? I think he's a little tight that his mom isn't including him in more of some of these pivotal moments, conversations, and decisions. I think he's feeling a little bit left out. He said something slick about the whole idea of getting faster Targaryens as dragon riders from Viseria was Viseria's idea. In this episode, he tried to show some support by standing by his mom's side. But even though he did all that, he's still ain't getting included. He's still not involved. But on the other hand, this is smart from Rhaenyra to not include Jace to come flying out to Harrenhal because he is the next in line for the throne. And Rhaenyra is already doing something risky by flying out herself. So it wouldn't make sense for them to bring Jace and put their whole royal line at risk at the same time. But he's also tight that he gets left behind to babysit all. Oh. <laughs> we then switch to see Damon, who's being visited by Alice Rivers, who's just in his room, sitting at the foot of his weirwood tree bed that he just keeps sleeping in no matter what, which is just weird to me. But uh, she's in here sleep, sitting at his bed, and all she says is that she's going to the gods. And I thought this was kind of interesting and kind of stood out to me because she didn't call it the werewood this time she's referring it she's referring to it as the god's word damon follows and uh this is when things get freaky because we see an antler god thingy dude over here we see this dude walking up towards the tree now this is interesting because we know this tree is associated with the first men and the children of the forest. But deers are really only things that we usually see associated with House Baratheon. But I did my research for y'all. I found out that this is actually a tease for the Order of the Green Men. Now, the Order of the Green Men is believed to be a secret order that are the guardians of the Isle of Faces. The Isle of Faces, get this y'all, is located in the middle of the lake called the God's Eye. It's an island that's covered in werewood trees. This island, as I said, is in the middle of the God's Eye Lake, right next to Harrenhal. This group 
uh, the green men, they're closely tied to the old gods and the ancient religion of the children of the forest and the first men. Now, the primary role of the green men is to act as guardians of the werewoods on the island. Again, this island has a lot of werewood trees, which we know are religious objects to the people who pray to the old gods. The Isle of Faces is also significant because it's where the treaty was signed between the First Men and the Children of the Forest to end their 2,000 years of conflict. The Order of the Green Men are the guardians of the island, and they're pretty good at it, um, as it's pretty well known that anyone who goes there really doesn't ever really make it back. Now, I don't think that the green men really play a major role in the stories of the books, but their appearance here seems to be more of a symbol of the magic that is associated with the werewood trees. Um, obviously, the God's Eye stands out as we know that this is where Helena is going to prophesize later in the uh, episode where Aemon is going to meet his fate. Um, but again, I just think it's interesting that this is called out and highlighted in this moment with the appearance of this type of character uh we then see alice talk a little bit about how she was able to influence dave about how when he first got there he was a closed fist damon ain't got no comeback he ain't got nothing because uh we see that damon is kind of sort of scared of alice a little bit like, he's a little shook up about how things have been playing out in this whole time that he's been in this castle. Um, he knows that she represents change, and he's just not sure what to expect. Alice places his head on the tree. And we also learn that uh, this tree has the face of Game of Thrones creator George R.R. R. Martin. Now, I learned this after watching the making of the last episode that the werewood tree, this is kind of an Easter egg. They they carved his face in the tree, which I th just thought was kind of neat. Um, but this right here, this right here in this moment, Damon sees the prophecy. He sees Aegon the Conqueror's dream and we see him go through all the key moments with something extra when he sees this. He sees this Targaryen looking dude that is definitely a three eyed raven. Now, spoiler alert, his name is Brendan Rivers. I don't know if this is going to be a spoiler for House of the Dragon, but Brendan Rivers is no also known as the Blood Raven. He's the three eyed raven of the books, and it feels like his inclusion in this scene could just be more set up for either future seasons of this show or one of the many other spinoffs in the in development like a knight of the seven kingdoms now he's referred to as a blood raven due to that birthmark on his face that we see a raven fly out of in a moment uh but something tells me that the creators didn't go through all this effort to have this character appear or go as far as to cast him right we didn't see dayron get cast but this dude got cast I don't think they went as far as to do all this if we weren't going to see him again down the line. But yeah, I think that this is the same three-eyed raven that we see later as an older gentleman in the OG Game of Thrones series that trains Bran Stark. So, one way or another, we will see him again. But it will be interesting to see how and when we see him again. But I did want to just give you guys a little bit of insight there. This is Brendan Rivers. Yeah, I know he's got the same name as Alice. Uh, he is the three-eyed raven. We then get into seeing uh, the great threat from the north. And we see the White Walkers that we know are coming in Game of Thrones. Now, I saw some folks online wondering, how the Night King looks different? And that's fair. I know, I get it. I watch TV a lot. I get it. I understand why people are making this assumption, but I'm pretty sure that this dude here is actually one of the Night King's generals um, that he was walking around with. I think that's this dude. 
right? Doesn't that look more like him than the Night King? <laughs> anyway, we also see a huge battle. And there are bodies everywhere. But not only are there human bodies everywhere. There's also dragon bodies. I don't even know what dragon that is. But they're laid out in this mayhem too. Wow. This is the battle. This is the battle. I thought we were getting this battle this episode. Or maybe it's something else. But this is really, really dark stuff. And I know that this story doesn't necessarily have a happy ending. But wow. This is a wild sight to see. Uh, Damon also briefly sees these two comets or meteors that seem to like they're heading toward the planet. Uh, I think this is either from the doom of old Valeria or it's from the comet that prophesies the return of dragons in the world of Westeros back in the OG Game of Thrones. Uh, we also then see the dragon eggs that we know to become Drogon, Rhaegal, and Viserion. Uh, we see the prince slash princess that was promised that we learned to be Daenerys. Um, and then we get to cut to a scene of Rhaenyra sitting on the Iron Throne and ruling with Helena then showing up in Damon's dream and telling him that this is all a story. And what just happened? What? Yo, 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 yo. I'm telling y'all. I knew this girl was acting, acting. You over here, the three-eyed raven with the future sight? Are you, are you this world's three-eyed raven? Are you working with Alice? What is going on? She just showed up in his, she either in his, what? And, and Damon, Damon is shocked. He's like, what? Damon was all of us in this world because we're going to see in a moment that the camera just slyly cuts away. And it looks like she was talking to Damon in the Werewood hallucination from King's Landing. Or she was at least remote watching the whole thing, right? It looks like she was either telling my guy he knows what he must do and doing it from there. But it, it, it feels like we got the confirmation I've been telling y'all about this whole time. Always pay attention to Helena. Do y'all see this? She is playing the game levels above everyone else. She's the reason I'm wearing this shirt. Whatever her motivation, remember, this is the woman who had to point out her son to assassins in the middle of the night. She did that. She is saying that Damon is just a role in a part of a bigger story and everyone has a role to play like yo Helena levels above the fact that she knows this is she just playing simple like is she just playing like she doesn't know what's going on and is just orchestrating things it feels like she is not as simple as people think she is. She knows what is up. And I'm excited to see where we go from there. <laughs> we then see this scene right here with Amy. Uh, and he shoots his shot again with his sister to get her... To get her to ride out with him on her dragon to go to war with the Blacks. Eamon wants her to go with him to Harrenhal to fight Damon and his armies. And it's in this moment, Helena chooses figurative violence by talking hush. She talks hush. She's like, what if I refuse? Will you burn me as you did Aegon? And Eamon tries to lie his way out and she tells him that she saw it. She also tells him that Aegon will be king again. He has yet to see victory and he sits on a wooden throne. Now, hold on. I don't like the sound of that one bit. Because the only wooden throne that we've seen so far was the Driftmark throne that we saw 
after Rhaenys went down and we saw Lord Corlys go sit in his throne. So my guy Aegon was headed to Bravo. So why is she over here predicting this? She also tells Aemon that he won't be around for this. He, he's going to be long gone. And he's going to be swallowed up in the God's eye. And he's never going to be seen again. Now, that's interesting that she talks about the whole thing in the past tense. Uh, but it's interesting because we also know that the God's eye is that large lake in the area of Harrenhal. So, it's that's the case. Then she is kind of saying he might lose his... Like, his fate is sealed in that lake, right? Going to Harrenhal is the end of him. Aemon is visibly furious and tells his sister that he could have her taken out. And she tells him that it wouldn't change anything. And then she just walks off like a boss. And I love this moment for Helena because it feels like in this moment that we're learning what type of game she's really playing. I didn't know that she was like this, but oh, she just left bulbs above. We then switch to uh, Rhaenyra and Adam flying out to Harrenhal and Caraxes is ready. He's like, what are we doing? Are we, we here, cousin? Or we pop? What do we do? What do we do? Caraxes is ready. Um, the soldiers aren't sure what's going on, but they're smart enough to know to run first and ask questions later. Rhaenyra then goes to solo her way into Harrenhal, and then she sees this massive army that Daemon has assembled from the people in the Riverlands. Uh, we then see Rhaenyra's dragon Cyrax remind us, sometimes you gotta pop up and show soldiers. You know, she's not alone, right? When she opened the door, ain't nobody moved. Sometimes you gotta pop out. And once this dragon shut, they, they got everybody stands at attention. What's going on? What's going on? Damon approaches, and we see that Sir Simon is falling in line with Damon. Damon tells Rhaenyra that he wasn't expecting her, and he softly says that the soldiers are swan to hit. Rhaenyra backs up to set the record straight and very loudly asks Damon. And to whom are you sworn? And this is when they all thought that Damon was going to have it out with her. Everybody was just waiting to see it all go down. But instead, Damon speaks to her in Old High Valerian and says that, Yo, I saw the vision. I saw the vision. He saw the vision and he don't want to be king no more. She tells Damon that, yo, you, you saying all that stuff that I've been saying. And Damon is shook it. He is all the way shook it. He don't want to be king no more. He saw what is happening. No, that vision straightened him all the way out. My guy, he, he is so remorseful. He couldn't bend the knee fast enough. He did that in front of everybody. And then all the soldiers here all get in line too. Even Sir Alfred Broom Trader here. And Rhaenyra seems a little bit surprised, but also tells da Damon that she ain't gonna tolerate this mess from him no more. Like, that was a threat. That was a threat. You try this again, watch what happens. And Damon goes in for that little, you know, headbutt kiss thing that they sometimes do. And, you know, Rhaenyra's like, screw you, bum. Damon has a little Aegon moment here when he starts chanting and waving his sword in the sky like uh, uh, and I can't help but feel like this is a little bit of a bad omen and I like that in this moment you can kind of see Sir Simon in the background just slightly out of focus behind Rhaenyra and if you look at this scene he's all clapping he's all happy he's like he's been taking Rhaenyra from the start and I I, I respect that I, I was just happy to see him doing that uh, we then switch to seeing Lord Corliss meeting up with Adam. And yo, yo, this scene is heavy. This scene is heavy. This scene is heavy. <laughs> Alan is ready to get back to his black job. 
And Lord Corliss is all like, you know, it'll be nice if you smile sometimes. And Alan just really doesn't know what to do with that. Corliss talks to him and he's all like, yo, he's just trying to help. And this clearly hits a nerve with Alan. And he tells Lord Corliss that this ain't when he needed help. Help would have been to not grow up fatherless. Help would have been to not grow up hungry. Help would have been to not grow up and feel left out. Help would have been to not see a father who felt ashamed of his children. Help would have been to not leave his kids in the street full of grief. And yo, yo, Alan admits, you know, like, look, he struggled as he watched. He watched Corliss as he was growing up. Walk right back to him with those other kids, not giving a hep. But now that they're gone, now that his son and daughter are gone, now he wants to help? Yo, Alec gives a hell of a speech and tells Corliss that he's gonna fall in line. He's gonna be a good soldier, but he doesn't want any of Lord Corliss's help. And yo, <laughs> felt oh to see alan get this off his chest like yo some of us got daddy issues and i think a whole bunch of us got to live through alan a little bit in this scene oh that was nice um we didn't switch to raina and they didn't know man and i look I, I know you out here but raina look girl you you gotta start doing something and then I guess she kind of does because she finally sees the dragon that she's been tracking, you know, flying overhead. Uh, we then switch to Rhaenyra and Viseria and Rhaenyra's back at dragon stuff like, yo, this episode is moving fast. She was just at Harrenhal and she's back at Dragonstone uh, with her dragon Cyrax and Sea Smoke playing outside and she's home. She's home. Rhaenyra doesn't really want to go to war. And she's just confiding in this area that, you know, she's sensitively aware of the countless innocent lives that are going to suffer as casualties in her family's war. This area is like, you knew that when you started. We did switch to later that night. Oh, yes, this scene is juicy. Later that night, while well, Rhaenyra gets a visitor and we see that Allison has come to Dragonstone without Helena. I told y'all. I told y'all. Helena knows what's gonna happen. So that felt intentional for her to stay behind. But anyway, Allison does her worst attempt at an apology. So, you know, perpetuating this whole civil war and, you know, starting a Targaryen blood feud. And, you know, she's sorry that she's made so many mistakes and, uh, you know, judging, you know, being a little judgy with Rhaenyra about, you know, the way she was as the young woman. Um, and she tells Rhaenyra that... He... She tells Rhaenyra that uh, she wants out from this war. Hey. <laughs> And she talks about how she's so, so sorry for all her many mistakes, especially in judging her. Uh, she wants out from this war, and she's also asking if she could take Helena and her daughter and leave it all behind. Rhaenyra is all like, go, but don't accept me to accept your weak old apology. Allison then tells Rhaenyra that Aemon is going to be flying out to the Riverlands to join Kristen Cole. And this right here is the intel that I feel like we're going to it's going to prove to be valuable later, right? Because you can see the look on Rhaenyra's face when she hears this info because she knows, right? Knowing where Aemon is going to be is how she can take this mofo out once and for all. Allison then has some weak, weak 
weak plan for Rhaenyra to just walk in the King's Landing and they're just gonna give her the throne. You know, no bloodshed, no beef. That works for you, right? And Rhaenyra's all like, yo, what about Aegon? What about Aegon? And she's right, because the last thing she needs is a living person that can challenge her rule. We saw what happened the first time. And Allison is all like, you know, I could get him to bend the knee, girl. Don't even act, don't even act up. It's fine. I could get him to bend the knee. And Rhaenyra is like, no. No, chick. No. A son for a son. I have to take Aegon's head. And I have to do it publicly for everyone to see. You know this. And she's right. Rhaenyra is, you know, she is the main person advocating for peace. But she's 100% right. She cannot allow any potential threats to her taking the throne to just walk around. <laughs> she tells Allison that she needs to choose. And this also reminds me of like what Helena had to do. Right? Al Helena had to choose when Blood and Cheese showed up and had to choose one of her children. Allison now has to choose and sacrifice Aegon if she wants to make peace with Rhaenyra so she can live with Helena and her grandkids happily ever after. And she agrees. She agrees. Allison surprisingly asks Rhaenyra to run away with her? She's like, yo, come with me. And that's some, yo, that's some real let's just be friends again stuff. And that's how Rhaenyra knows that Allison is being sincere with her about this whole plan and everything because she's trying to appeal with appeal to her as a friend. Um, it's also interesting because I think this is the first time we see Allison not wearing green. Like she's wearing blue, which is the color she used to wear before she got married. Uh, but this, this she's legitimately trying to appeal to Rhaenyra as a friend, and it's interesting to see her in this light again. Oh. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a rough conversation for her, especially as she has to accept the loss of Aegon. Uh, we then switch to see... Ah, yeah, we then switch to see Hugh, uh, Adam, uh, we see Ulf, and they're all getting armored up to go to war. Because we know what Rhaenyra said, that it's going to be time to go to war in two days' time. It feels like that was two days ago. Uh, we also have this cool-looking scene of the Hightower army making their way to war. Uh, I think that this is more Hightower troops coming from Old Town, going to meet up with Sir, Quist Sir Kristen and Sir Gwen. And we also see a very blue dragon is flying over the army. And I'm pretty sure that this is Allison's other son, Daeron Targaryen, and his dragon, Tessarion. And it looks like they're making their way to the Riverlands. We don't get a good shot of Daeron himself, but I'm pretty sure that that is him with his dragon. We also get this cool shot of the men from the north. Yes! Yes! The Greybeards! The, the Greybeards! The ones that the Stark sent from the wall to come battle for Rhaenyra's side. They're making their way over the bridge of the Freys and they're heading to Harrenhal 2. And yo, that's a lot of Greybeards. Uh, we also then click to see, uh, switch to see Jason Lannister with his, yo, he's got some solid looking arm. I think he's probably got my favorite arm. I ain't gonna uh, but he's making his way into the Riverlands too. And let's not forget that when he comes through, he comes through with lions. Uh, when we see him making his way to the Riverlands, we also see Damon. Damon is walking out of Harren Hall and he looks like he lives for this stuff. He lives for he He's in his element again. Damon looks at his army and, you know, when you kind of think of it, it feels like this is a perfect storm of a huge battle of five armies. 
and it doesn't really seem like there's going to be a clear winner here because we also switched to see Tylen Lannister on his boat and he's bringing forces to go to battle against Lord Corlys's forces and him and Adam and Hull are out there at sea getting prepared to go to war in the ocean and if that's not enough we then see that Reyna has finally found that wild dragon sheep steal and we see her we see sheep Ste yo sheep stealer looks like a gnarly dragon like you can tell he sleeps outside don't he look like the most homeless he look like he sleep on the atrium but yo sleep Ste sheep stealer looks rough uh we also see uh Otto. oh my god Otto, Otto hightower he is in a cage who captured him who we don't know but Somebody captured him and they've been keeping it a secret for a while because we know that Otto has been searched for ever since Aemon took control of King's Landing. First thing he said is, go find my grandsire, you lick spittle. At least I know he's loyal. He's been missing in action ever since. Uh, we also quickly see Sir Laris and Aegon are sneaking out of King's Landing. Um with this episode ending with some nice shots of uh, a good shot of he, he walked out of there. Aegon got out of there. Uh, we also see these cool shots of this uh, Alicent and Rhaenyra as they stare off and the season ends with them kind of the same way that it began. And yo, that was <laughs> welling like, I can't say I was underwhelmed. I definitely wasn't overwhelmed. I was just whelmed. Like, I'm not saying it was a bad episode, but I felt like the episode, the season, was building up to us seeing another battle. You know, just going by the pacing of the way show, the show used to go, at least OG Game of Thrones. It felt like that we were going to see another epic moment either in the finale or the episode right before the finale. OG Game of Thrones, penultimate episode, you're getting a battle, you're getting a war, or you're getting a sword fight. We got a mud fight. It's not the same, y'all. I was just, well, I'm curious how all of you felt about this episode. I think I think the consensus is pretty universal across the internet. Everybody's just a little whelmed. It's like, it's not terrible. And I'm gonna be back. But that's not what I that's, that's not what that's not what I thought it was gonna be. Um, let me see what you guys are saying. Uh Alex Nepp. Alex Nepp says, wait, a goth girl on Team Black? I'm so surprised. Yes, and she's not the only one. <laughs> But yeah, got the girl. She's we love her around here. She's Team Black as am I. Um, Ephraim Colbert stopped in to say uh, this season finale was dull. I fell asleep while watching it. I can't blame you. I can't blame you. You know, I came into this episode expecting one thing, and I walked away with something else entirely. Uh, I just. Ugh. It didn't have that oomph that I wanted. But again, I'm going to be back in two years. I'm going to be back. But that, that was a little under... That was well. Uh, Old Tret, thank you for stopping by. Old Tret, you said you stopped by to say, was Alicet lying? I don't know. It just felt fake. So I don't think Alicet was lying in that moment with Rhaenyra, especially because she asked her to go with her. So... It almost felt like she was like, you know, come with me when I run away. It wasn't like, come with me to King's Landing right now. We'll figure it out. That would have been a trap. It felt like, hey, once you take the Iron Throne and we set things straight, you take Aeon's head, won't you run away with me and we could go somewhere else and just raise our kids, the ones that want to come with us. And that, to me, felt like it was Allison breaking character and being sincere uh, in that moment to Rhaenyra and telling her what she honestly felt, right? She was she had those little moments where she started biting her nails and 
she we haven't really seen her do that since season one when uh before she took the throne um it felt like she was showing her true self for the first time in a long time but yeah i i don't think allison was lying but we're, we'll see you know maybe maybe it wouldn't be the first time we got lied to by the green especially by her uh rainera is lame uh, uh, is she she's she's to me she felt justified so we'll see i don't think she's lame um more so as that she feels justified and she's she's weary right she's a very cautious leader um what else we got <laughs> you should open the lines to a uh, call it we got to talk about this lame character development I do got the call it. I do have the call it. Could open this up for us to call in uh, and get this started. Let's uh, let's see how the rest of these comments go. Maybe I'll, I'll open it up. Let's see if we get a call. Um, Gothic chick, uh, don't don't. I'm we team black over here. I we we team black. Um, old Trek, what about oh? What was he doing? Oh, Oaf was getting ready to go to war. Right, we saw him uh getting armored up, so to speak, but uh he wore his own type of attire. It, we know that the different dragon seeds are gonna be sent out to different strategic locations to fight, but I'm wondering if that is going to change now that Rhaenyra has that strategic piece of information about where Aemon is gonna be later. Right? She didn't know where Aemon was going to be, which is why she was like, Look, let me go send all of my soldiers out to different places. They can't attack us everywhere. But now that she has an idea of where Aemon is going, I wonder if she's going to change her strategy and where she's going to send the dragon seeds when we finally do get into season three. But uh, yeah, I think Ulf was just getting involved to go uh, follow through with whatever Rhaenyra had planned for her. I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, that, that is the episode. Let me, let me see. There's 10 people still in here. Let me go ahead. Give me a second. I'll open up this call in line and we can, uh, we can actually get some call-ins. <laughs> now, let me put this on the bottom for y'all so you guys see it from now. The call in line is going to be at the ticker at the bottom. I can take a couple of calls. I can't be out here all night. It's still, it's still a school night, y'all. But uh, let me let me go ahead and open this up for us right now. And add this as... Into our street. through the night city lights so bright